Good afternoon. It is really a pleasure to introduce our symposium keynote speaker today, Michael Dorff, who's the founder and CEO of City Winery. He's a recognized leader in multiple fields that mean a lot to all of us. Uh, wine, of course, music, food, uh, philanthropy. And of course, I was asked to do this introduction because like Michael, I have a long background in the music business. And though I've just met him for the first time, like many other people in the music business, I've had a, a very long admiration for his uh, creative and entrepreneurial spirit and the zeal and ambition he brings to everything that he does. His list of accomplishments is long. In 1986, at the age of 23, 23, he started the Knitting Factory, which is a legendary downtown New York music club. It's a record label uh, and a tech innovator. It started in a storefront in an unglamorous part of the city, which I think nobody could afford now, but then was uh, a little sketchy to walk to. And it soon brought together an enviable range of musicians who loved it for the chance it gave them to push musical boundaries. Uh, I could almost be describing the beginning of our industry. I think many of you will see your story and Michael's stories. Um, by 1990, in an effort to connect to larger audiences, he had put together a syndicated national radio show, which was almost unheard of, uh, given the focus of the Knitting Factory. And by 1994, back, as you recall, 1994, just having an AOL count, that was a status symbol. Uh, Michael was already doing live streaming over the internet um, and pioneering new ways to reach audiences through all the technologies that were available and coming up with collaborations with companies like Apple before they knew, uh, you know, had a glimmer of what iTunes could be. Michael already had an idea for them. His record company released more than 200 albums at the time and what I, I didn't tell him is that these records are, are really prizes, and at the time I had my own PR firm, and I called up his company, and I, I called up his promotion people. There was one record in particular by a keyboardist named Steve Naive, and I was so moved by the record that I just said, hey look, I'll, I'll volunteer my company services, whatever it takes, I just want to be a, a part of what you guys are doing at the Knitting Factory. So um, it's really a pleasure to have met Michael today. Uh, in, addition, in addition to all this, he has founded multiple music festivals, staged concerts around the world, opened venues around the country, organized charitable events, started a Hebrew school in Tribeca, and of course produced uh, his signature Carnegie Hall tribute concerts, which is why New York Magazine calls him one of the 10 most influential New Yorkers, which is not bad for a guy from Milwaukee. Uh, in 2008, Michael, a major wine lover, launched City Winery in New York. Um, of course, he already had a strong interest in Oregon wine, uh, which is part of why he's here. Um, City Winery is this brilliant combination of a, a, a full-functioning urban winery, uh, world-class music venue, and the top drawer restaurant. The idea was a hit in New York, so he launched it in uh, Chicago, and then Napa, and uh, Nashville uh, since then. And it's no accident that the Willamette Valley Winers Association has held its Pinot in the City events uh, at City Winery whenever and wherever possible. I think the thread here is simple, that uh, you start with something you love and know how to grow it. So uh, please give a warm Oregon wine industry welcome to Michael Dorf. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you all for, for having me, uh, the Oregon Wine Board and, and wine growers. Uh, I really need to, state, to, to thank the entire state of Oregon uh, and give it credit for having me get into my current business, City Winery. Uh, a quick story on, on that fateful visit to this great state, and then I'll continue with my remarks, which I hope will shed a little bit of light uh, into ultimately selling more wine at a higher margin for all of you, perhaps how to differentiate your brand in a very crowded marketplace, and ultimately turn your, your customers into passionate fans. You know, I heard the theme of storytelling at some of the early panels, and I think much of my remarks will echo uh, those, those themes as well, because getting your story out there is critical. For me, it's about how do you use technology to get that story uh, out there. Now, 
as, as David said, I had started a small club in New York uh, called the Knitting Factory in 1987. And after 9-11, a few years, I really wanted to do something a little more uh, rewarding and, and personally satisfying. Uh, so in 2004, I got very lucky and got a chance to make a barrel of wine with David Tate, who was the assistant to Paul Draper at Ridge on the Montebello label. And I had a blast. David was a friend of my brother Josh's who got a call and said that, that they had a ton of Cabernet and would we want to make some wine? And I asked my brother, I said, a, a ton, you mean 2,000 pounds? And he goes, no, it's actually going to be about 2,500 pounds uh, for a, a, some great cab. And 16 months later, uh, we hand corked about 700 bottles and made the labels. And I had really caught the bug, or I guess a better metaphor, I had drank the Kool-Aid and realized that I, I really wanted to have wine in my future. The next year, I brought my little kids and wife here to Oregon to the Willamette Valley for a, for a family uh, trip, but really wanted to visit a for sale sign that I had seen near Domaine Joanne and an archery summit in the Dundee Hills, one of my favorite areas to, to taste. Uh, and a side note, I got turned on to Domaine Joanne uh, by the late great musician Lou Reed. Uh, who had been playing at the Knitting Factory and was also, like me, a, a real Burgundy fan. And he turned me on to, to Joanne and, 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 and a love of the Willamette Pinots. But anyways, after a few days of tasting with my kids in the back seat of the car, who were really bored as can be, and I suggested at, at one point we stopped and looked at the beautiful hills and said, what do you think, should we sell our apartment in Tribeca? and move out of Manhattan and come to this beautiful spot and work the land and, and, and get into winemaking. And in unison, they all said, including my wife, and now my kids do swear, you know, I haven't raised them very well, but they said, no friggin' way, Dad, are we moving out of New York to this spot. Uh, so necessity breeds invention, and... Uh, I had to figure out a way to, to start a winery in Manhattan if I wanted to do this and keep my family. So a, a simple inversion of the classic model, bring the grapes to the consumer, to where the consumption happens, and there make the wine versus right next to the vineyard. But as we all know, while it's uh, hard to make good wine, it's even harder to sell it. So luckily, I combined my music background to help lead the crowds to the watering hole. But before getting into the specifics of what we're doing that could help be applicable to all of your unique businesses, I thought it would be important to create uh, some context for my remarks uh, with an 11-minute um, uh, but highly detailed and comprehensive history of music and wine, with perhaps a few observations on the technological shifts uh, that happen with consumption along the way. So, this will only take 10 minutes and 45 seconds, but you're going to learn a lot. It all starts 6,000 years ago in the Middle East, with the oldest discovery by archaeologists of, of, of winemaking in Armenia, including fermenting vats, storage jars, and a wine press from 4100 BC. So let's look at a timeline. In 4,000 years at 3 BC, scholars disagree on the exact date, but that was the birth of Jesus. And then right here, at the other end of the timeline, 1939, the birth of David Lett of Erie Vineyards. And then back somewhere around 30 to 33 was the most famous wine dinner in history, uh, a Passover Seder with four cups of wine combined with a lot of song and music. It's an interesting fact that there really is a Da Vinci Code. It was found in the Last Supper that the loaves of bread in the painting correspond to notes when a score is read from right to left. The result is a 40-second hymn to God as discovered in 1987 by Giovanni Maria Paola. It's true, look in Wikipedia. It's perfectly accurate. Uh, jump to the 15th century Bordeaux wine uh, was introduced to France by the Romans in the first century, 
it, but it wasn't until the 12th century that these wines actually caught the attention of England due to the developing technology of shipping. But back on the timeline, let's just now look at the last thousand years. And if we go to the 1600s, the age of Elizabeth, which was a golden time in literature, theater, and music, Shakespeare's theater had live music, and local pubs around it actually had ties to the shows. L and beer were the drink of choice. 58 micro ale breweries and 33 beer microbreweries just in the city of London in 1574. Wine was available, but it was 12 times the cost of beer, given the high cost of the transportation industry. Thus, wine was really for the upper classes, and this is the beginning of wine being a snooty beverage for society. 1785, Thomas Jefferson, a founding father of the US, and author of the Declaration of Independence was really the first to lay groundwork for winemaking in America when he succeeded uh, Ben Franklin as the US minister to France in 1785. Five years he lived in Paris, started collecting wines, studied viticulture, and came back to plant grapes and vines in Monticello, Virginia. He played the violin and cello and declared, music is the favorite passion of my soul and officially started the White House concert series complete with serving wine. One of my favorites is P.T. Barnum. He put on his first big show at Castle Clinton in the Battery in Lower Manhattan in September 11th, 1850. Uh, the theater also served beer and wine and was a wine garden when there were not shows until 1855 when the U.S. government took over this property for immigration before moving it to Ellis Island. Now let's look at how fast time starts to speed up in the last 165 years. 1878, Thomas Edison etched grooves on a cylinder to create the first phonograph. Ten years later, Emily Berliner imprinted grooves on a flat side of a disc and called it a record. By 1902, this became standardized to go at a speed of 78 RPM and then 33 another 20 years later. Essentially, the recorded music industry is 100 years old. In 1928, Benny Goodman released the first album and soon was named King of Swing. His music was played on AM radio, a technology less than 10 years old. The first experimental, experimental TV by RCA was still more than 15 years away when Benny became the first true TV American Idol. In the 1950s, Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack influenced drinking, but wine was still dreck in the United States, mostly because prohibition had killed the US wine industry. Meanwhile, the first pocket transistor radio was being introduced along with the first color televisions. 1965, a very, very important year. The Beatles came to play an unprecedented to 55,000 screaming fans at Chase Stadium. That same year, Robert Mondavi split from his family at Charles Krug to establish the first large-scale new winery in the Napa Valley since Prohibition, and perhaps even more importantly, broke convention by labeling wine by variety. And that same year, David Lett of Ari Vineyards planted the first Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley. The American wine industry had entered its infancy. Now let's look at the speed of change just in the last 50 years. Nineteen seventy-six, Bob Dylan organizes the Rolling Thunder Review with Joan Baez playing 57 concerts in 60 days. Here he is drinking wine backstage, clearly some delicious Italian jug wine. That same year was the famous Judgment of Paris, illustrating that America could produce quality wine. Stag's Leap and Chateau Montalena beat their French counterparts. And another thing, the first Apple computer was introduced in July 1976 for $666.66. 1987, CDs replaced vinyl as the format of choice with the Sony Walkman already becoming obsolete with the introduction of portable disc players. Margaret Mondavi starts a concert series in Napa as the wine region starts its growing reputation as America's wine mecca. By 2004, the digital music has destroyed the record business. 
The film Sideways brought the pop spotlight on Pinot Noir just as wine consumption in America quadrupled from what it was 10 years previously, becoming a dominant part of the American cultural lifestyle. Meanwhile, in those same 10 years, CD sales went from 900 million units down to 150 million units, an even larger but opposite decline of wine sales in the United States. In 2008, City Winery New York opens and the iPhone is released, selling 10 million units its first year. It's currently selling 300 million units a year, ushering in a new wave of mobile access, listening to music with the largest repository of collections ever, bringing the new dawn of social media, mobile communications and interaction. In 2008, Facebook was only three years old and just getting its first serious investment dollars. And Netflix was considering starting a stream video. Today, the number of connected devices to the internet has tripled from 8 billion to 208 in 2008 to 25 billion in just seven years. Consumption of music has reached the masses via multiple formats, mostly free. In less than 100 years, the recorded music industry has gone from a marvel to a free commodity. Music is everywhere, but you still can't digitize wine. So here's the essence of my remarks for today. Thank God you can't digitize wine and sperm. <laughs> Otherwise, we would all be seriously challenged, but you can digitize everything else. The point is best articulated by Eric Schmidt, former CEO and current chairman of Google, in the recent book, Google, and I quote, in today's internet world, information is free, copious, and ubiquitous. Almost everything is online. Secondly, mobile devices and networks have made a global reach and con continuous conductivity widely available. And third, cloud computing has made infinite power and storage inexpensive and available to the world's population, soon available to the next billion, five billion people in the next few years. So almost everybody's wine or wine product in this room is being sold, reviewed, or touched online. It's maybe sold through your club directly, by a store, perhaps Amazon, maybe tasted and tracked by a seller tracker, Yelp reviewed, socially networked, traded, sold, images transferred to your product daily, whether you're aware of it or not. You might be blogging about your crush, tweeting about trellising practices, or giving your club members access via a camera to your vineyard 24-7. Or maybe the production is so small and so coveted that only a few people chat about it in their private clouds. But unlike the music business, the resulting conversations, transfers, and downloads all support the opportunity to create chatter about your product. Product that cannot be digitized into zeros and ones. Wine cannot be digitized. Music is digitized, and most of our kids don't ever consider paying for it. It's become a commodity, yet music has never been consumed as much. The industry has completely shifted from where records and CDs got support of the artists performing live, touring and promoting their physical product to sell, to a world where albums, singles, and music releases are there to support the one precious value of music that truly can't be digitized, and that's the intangible product, the live musical event. But I would posit further that the, live, the value of a live concert increases when, you, when you're in a room that does not require large image magnification, large screens on the side of a stage in an arena or a stadium, while still being thrilled to be in a room with 50,000 other fans, it's not the same as looking in the eye of an artist seen with your own eyes the sweat dripping down their face and truly connecting in an intimate concert environment. That's the increased value of in intimacy, one that no high definition 500 billion pixel camera can, can capture. Now combine that with some great Shehalem Mountain uh, wine in a Riedel glass 
and you've got a real winner in my book, a luxury concert experience. But what we're trying to do with City Winery goes one step further than just combining uh, a great concert experience with a great glass of wine. We're also trying to do that in a meaningful connection of an authentic experience, something that is striking a chord in today's society. We are additionally showcasing the beautiful art and craft of winemaking to culture seekers. We are certainly more of a music club than we are a wine club. The winemaking, though, is the differential that distinguishes us from all the rest. More than just decoration, the smell of fermenting grapes in the fall, the spills during racking, and the tap being poured from stainless steel kegs in our, our system hidden behind French oak barrels is a continuous reminder to our customers, our fans, that we are a true working winery. Now, is a majority of our nightly sales, concert tickets, food and beverage versus retail wine sales? Absolutely, about 80% right now. But I'm confident we would not be as popular if it were not for the fact that we are making wine and showing off the beautiful art form of winemaking. It is this aspirational signifier of craftsmanship, connoisseurship, and authenticity that customers care about today, more than the conventional wisdom of pricing and brand. People care about where their products come from. Michael Burke, CEO of Louis Vuitton, LVMH, owners of a couple of products like Bovardi, Donna Karen, Christian Dior, Tag Hauer Watches, Moet Hennessy, Dom Perignon, Vive Clicquot, Chateau Chevrolet Blanc, Chateau de Kem, Domaine Chandon, Glamourangi, and a couple others. <laughs> Said recently in the New York Times, if the 20th century was about manufacturing, the 21st century will be about intangibles, concern for preservation, heritage, and the environment. It is the intangible art form of winemaking that is distinguishing our company, not just as a better mousetrap to hear and see a show, but a place with integrity and creating an authentic product. And here in Oregon, you have intangible authenticity in spades, from some of the best terroir in the country to make great wine and a deep and widespread concern for the healthy and sustainable farming practices that go along with it. Being seen as authentic or having transparent integrity is part of the value add, the experiential value add that we can offer our customers. This is the intangible part of our city, water, city winery product that offers a connection to the deep tradition, the tradition of winemaking and music making, both creative industries that the superficial and cheap don't survive. They don't become long lasting brands. Vintage is something that lasts. And although with wine it has a, a shelf life, the value of the limited pieces increases with the limited quantities. Music, and especially the fact that there's an unlimited supply of digital music, thus devalues the recorded output of an artist, but only then increases the value of the live performance of the artist. One could argue that the vintage musician's performances can become more valuable with time, and the potential growing scarcity of their future performances increases their value. Then one could extrapolate that there is a price of performance tied to the total real fan base and the potential tickets available. Therefore, with a limited number of tickets available in a seated intimate concert space, the value of that live performance is increased and can move from being a general offering to a luxury offering. Intimacy, to me, is defined as the performer being able to see into the eyes of every person in the room. Spaces over 500 are just simply too big to achieve that. The intimacy and the ability to connect in the same way. You can see in our Chicago location, the barrels in the background, every person who walks in, every customer or fan who walks in can see that we are a real winery and the artists from the stage can so as well. I would say that City Winery is to the Willamette Valley what a large stadium is to Napa Valley. People will pay for the intimacy, for the quality, and to understand the story of where their product comes from. 
And the digital era allows us all, all of us little guys, to tell a better story to more and more targeted listeners, to be able to show off the authentic and real commitment to green, natural, organic farming practices. Your fans want to know the devotion to dirt, trellising, the amount of grapes dropped during the season. These stories of your authenticity are a way for us to truly connect to our customers. We actually charge our fans in New York to work on a sorting table as part of an experiential package that includes wine tasting. We charge them $40 an hour to work in our winery. Wow. Maybe we should charge more. This touch and feel connects. How many of your best customers would love to help prune the vines, work the harvest, or even clean the tanks and shovel pumice? But we need more than customers. We need advocates. We need fans. You never hear a rock band call their customers, uh, their fans, customers. And even worse, users like Google or Facebook. Well, there were some bands in the 60s that had a lot of users, but that's a different story. But what is the difference between a fan and a, and a customer? A, a fan is going to tell everyone they know how much they love the artist or the product. They're going to use the traditional word of mouth, which in the past required one person to tell one person at a time. But today, one person can, ten, can tell 10 million people with a simple 140-character tweet. We are so networked that one well-placed bottle, one strong review, the right club program, and the demand for your product can well exceed your supply. Imagine the story of one of your fans telling the world of their unforgettable experience, tilling the soil in the vineyard, or trimming the canopy of your vines, or just riding on a tractor. Charge them 40 an hour to till your, your property. This person is now a lifelong fan and they're going to tell every one of their Facebook friends, Instagram buddies, and Twitter followers about it. They're going to sell your wine for you. So when I look at the 600-plus wineries in Oregon and the world-class terroir from 18 AVAs, 72 varieties, I see stories to tell. And feed those stories to a growing trend of wanting to know where your product comes from combined with 25 billion connected devices around the globe, and I see many good stories spreading. And with a couple of clicks, people are buying your wine. Yeah, there's some legal hurdles still impeding the direct sale of wine from the days of, of prohibition, and those archaic uh, tied house laws, but change does happen in time, and there's some ways around it now with your sale. With the collection of your fans, you can start to avoid the traditional marketing systems and gain critical mass. We, for example, in New York have 150,000 emails, tens of thousands of social media followers, all of whom are fans and allow us to not spend any money on advertising, traditional or otherwise. Chicago is now up to about 50,000 names, so in another year of, of some media spending, our fan base will be large enough to send out an announcement of our shows or our new wine product, and we're going to fill up to capacity. Direct to our consumer improves margins by avoiding the inefficient distribution networks. But before summarizing, I, I want to tell one last story, uh, perhaps a lesson, of what we did to, to push our authenticity that kind of happened by accident. Remember on that timeline in 2008, I, I tried to make it seem like our timing of opening was genius with the introduction of the iPhone. But in 2007, when writing the business plan, I thought that the best way for us to sell our wine was going to be to sell it by the barrel, private labeled to wealthy wine aficionados. There was a place, maybe some of you knew, in San Francisco called Crush Pad that was apparently selling thousands of memberships for twelve to $15,000 a barrel. And it seemed like a sure way to sell our wine, while at the same time creating the vibe and the feeling I wanted in the venues, but not have to wait for the wine to be finished and I could pre-sell 300 barrels to bankers. So 
we bought mostly new French oak. I contracted for about 100 tons of the best fruit money could buy in California and here in Willamette. And uh, we had a, an amazing fall 2008 harvest. I signed up about 75 to 80 wine aficionados even before pouring the concrete in our winery in the summer of 2008 from some friends at Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bear Stearns, Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers. Well, the first grapes arrived the week Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And it was financial Armageddon in lower Manhattan. Not a single barrel, not a single banker wanted their name on a barrel of wine, even if they had put a deposit on it. The good news is we kept the holiday party money we got from Lehman Brothers. But the concept of, se of selling barrels to bankers evaporated. And with the exception of a few dentists, we now had 300 full barrels of very expensive wine in our cellar. It was not until the spring of 2009 that our first wine started to show, and we got some TTB approval on some labels and put wine into 15 and 30 gallon kegs and started to tap our wine and sell to customers. The first year we used traditional taps, and we sold a little bit, but when we put the wine in behind wooden barrels, and we enhanced the look and the vibe, we made it feel like old world winemaking, perhaps a bit more authentic, did the stories and thank God the, the sales start to flow. Today, almost 70% of our wine by the glass is sold using our tap system. In New York alone, we have now moved over a million glasses of wine in five years. That's 20 truckloads of bottles saved. No glass, no corks, no labels, no wasted pours, no added sulfites, just higher margins and a really cool story. So in summary, telling a good story about the authenticity of your non-digital product can be done easier and better than ever before using today's connected digital world. Leveraging this opportunity to tell a story honestly and communicate who you are, what makes your story different than the large corporate machines. It's why an upstart hamburger shack, chain like Shake Shack can go public and be worth $1.6 billion, and Mickey D's is losing value and market share with every burger sold today. So turn your customers into fans, who in turn, by word of mouth, help exponentially increase your lists. With lists, one can connect directly to your customers to reach them, allowing you to increase your margins on the sale of your product. So, Thank God you can't digitize wine. Being non-digital is our advantage as a group dedicated to quality, more intimacy, more authentic product with real stories to tell. Let's use digits to tell our story. Thank you. And I hope there's some questions. I have a, I'm, I'm, I'm an open textbook. You can ask me anything you want. If, step up to the mic and I will, I will address whatever you got to say candidly. That's it. Some questions? Can, can, can I ask a question? Please. Yeah, uh, when you're charging people $40 to come in and work in your winery, how, what's the workaround with labor laws? Because I keep reading about wineries fined into non-existence because families and friends come and help. So how do you get around that and do what you're doing? Uh, we don't. Um, we just do it. We are very careful. We actually sign a, a simple insurance waiver because uh, we, we really don't want the six-year-old's hand chopped off. But w we, we, we are cautious. Uh, we, we sort of just let people pick grapes on the sorting table and touch and feel the grapes. Um, it's, it's an experiential thing. It's, it's, they're not really working as much as I like to pretend it's, it's real work. Um, if someone really did work for me, I'd, I'd maybe call them an intern for a while. Uh, but no, that it's, it's just, we like to call it work, but it's, it's, it's play. I wish I could work for all my staff. Um, 
would love to be in Portland. Uh, we're, we're, we're announcing Atlanta to open this, this fall. We're then going to go to Toronto and Boston in 2016. And we're, we're unclear where, where it'll be next. We're, we're looking at a lot of markets. There's a big matrix that I have with a bunch of different variables on, on what would make a good market for us. I think Portland would be absolutely terrific, but we want to we wanna study it more. Uh, you know, there's a lot of elements from the music side of what we do. It'd be so cool to be this close to, you know, all the different terroir in this part of the country to, to not have to ship it as far. Uh, but there's a there's and there's no question there's a huge culinary scene here and we care a lot about that so that box is checked in the in the book. Seattle's a possibility. Vancouver could be cool. I I think we can be in a city near you. I hope at some point. Hello, uh, I have a question about social media. So. Um, uh, which social media platform is the best for wine products? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or something else? All of the above. I, I think, you know, I, my kids call me an old fogey for using Twitter, um, and, and, you know, that I really i am I'm so out of touch with what's going on. And, uh, you know, I can, can, is Snapchat a way to sell wine? I, there, there are so many platforms. I think you have to be on all of them. I think uh, it's it's impossible to just focus on one. Uh, they're they're all very valuable, and they're all different funnels to different different people. Yeah, so I have a pretty specific question about Instagram because it doesn't uh, like have a filter uh, which allows uh, only people over twenty one to follow a certain account. So, like, how do you brand yourself on Instagram there? I think there's nothing illegal about branding if you, to a minor. I think you just can't sell to a minor. Uh, I, I really would like to indoctrinate three-year-olds on the city winery brand. Um, I think that would be a success. And then in 18 years, hopefully we'll have, have them ready to directly deposit their paycheck into our account and sell them a lot of wine. Thank you so much. I have one question, and this is more of a philosophical question to deal with, since your music and other fields and media, you know, I spent a lot of time with local music. There's a lot of conversation about today, you know, if you're in Spotify, you would need, if you have 300 hits, you might make $4,000 a year. There, This free part for young and struggling people and different people is not an attribute because we don't know how to value that information even though it's there. And I sit a bit in that way as a small winemaker because I'm given a lot of pressure from other areas where, you know, can you give me this deal? Are you less, you're more? And as we have this wider group, how do we balance that sort of return for the talent in this small size versus larger groups taking over that piece? I mean, do you have a thought about where the future is going to lead in terms of this media and sales and community? Well, like I said before, the, the music industry has had to refocus its efforts on the areas that they can make money. So in music, it's publishing and the live performance. The, 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 the physical, the, the digital product, which replaced physical product, is, is now your little taster of what the artist will be like. Uh, with wine, if there was a way to digitize that taster, but not give up, you know, your entire inventory. That would be ideal, but thank goodness it doesn't exist. So, you know, uh, how much do you give away for free to turn people on? All right, that's one of the classic dilemmas. Uh, and and how? What other ways can you turn people on to product that you have in limited supply? And again, I, I'm I'm certainly a believer of getting them to touch and feel your your place and, and experience your wine with without drinking the entire cellar. It's a that it's a challenge. I'm sorry that we need to cut one, this short, one, Michael. One you'll be with us for just one a little last bit. Last question, please. <laughs> Thank you. What percentage of your wine is the wine that uh, you sell as your own wine as compared to other brands? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I I I do. Um, 
So we have a, a, about a 400 bottle list in all four of our locations. Uh, most of that is not our wine. It's great wine from here and from old world uh, winemakers. Uh, about 50% of the wine overall that we sell is not wine that we make. It's great wine that there's no way we could touch. The, the Pierrot or Burgundy, um, you know, they're old, old world wines that we'll never try and re replicate. Of the, so the 50% of the overall sales then is our wine. And of our wine sales, 70% is wine by the glass. And, and that wine is, is by tap. Uh, all, all, when the wine is ready to be bottled, instead of it going into bottles, we just put it into stainless steel kegs, and, and it's an incredibly efficient way to sell. There are nights that we'll do 1,000 or 1,500 glasses of wine in one night, so why open up all those bottles and waste all that cork? Um, and we can have perfectly efficient um, uh, pours, and, it, and, it's, it, and nothing goes to waste, except for what we give away for free. So. I'll turn over the microphone. I wish we could go on, and thank you, Carl, for that last question. You might have heard during the welcoming uh, remarks that uh, Michael took time to fly cross-country from his home in New York to, to be with us, leaving behind a couple of 16-year-old uh, twin boys that he hopes like hell are not into the cellar right now. Um, I can assure you they are. <laughs> Terrific comments. I'm, again, I'm sorry to cut this short. Uh, Michael will be with us for just a little bit longer, and um, uh, we're having a support group meeting over in this corner in just a minute for those of us who want to convince him to bring a city wine to Rita, Oregon. So uh, th please uh, join us in uh, 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 a very sincere and heartfelt thank you to Michael Dorf. Thank you. Excellent. Was it? Was it Excellent. Good?